Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. And oh my goodness, do I have a treat for you today. I am here with Susan Breton, who is a champion and advocate for all of those who desire intimacy and passion for their entire lives. She is the best-selling author and publisher of 34 books and programs, including Sexual Soulmates, Relationship Magic, Revive Her Drive, Ravish Him, Steamy Sex Ed, and the list goes on and on. She's been featured in the New York Times, CNBC, Today, ABC, CBC, I mean, and just everywhere else where you where the TV goes on, she's there. <laughs> and this is my favorite part, Susan. You are a member of the vintage TED Talk. So this is like before the TEDx, you were one of the original TED speakers. She's also a Barbizon trained model and she did mannequin modeling in department stores to put herself through college. She became a multimillionaire by age 37, lost everything and then went on to rebuild her business with, with incredible success. Her core expertise lies in the intersection between passionate lovemaking techniques and bedroom communication skills. So this is going to be a fun, fun conversation. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be with you again, Renee. Thank you so much. I enjoyed being on your event, your summit, your online event, and I'm happy to be on your podcast. Ah. And I'm, I'm really happy to talk about um, happy even after and the idea that the second time around, you really know yourself better. Mm. And we're going to talk about some benefits to um, what I call relationship values and why not understanding, not understanding them may have been the reason that your marriage 1.0 didn't work out and how you can have a 2.0 that is so much better. Or 3.0. We're a 3.0, we're a 4.0, we're a 5.0. Whatever. We just keep getting better. So what are relationship values? Yeah. Relationship values are what it is that you want out of your relationship with your partner. So let's assume that you and your partner are compatible, but completely different people. Um, let's also assume that there's a good chance that you're a female and your partner is a male. Now, that's not always true. And the things that I'm about to say work across the gender spectrum for people of all ages, all cultures, all religions, all persuasions. But generally, there are things that are important to you in a relationship. And the, the question that you ask yourself is, would I be in a relationship if I couldn't have this thing? And they are things that make meaning in your life and are the feelings that you want to feel when you're in a relationship. That's what relationship values are. A lot of the, t you, you mentioned that I was on all the different TV channels. I'm almost always on television talking about my free, no, it's not free, sorry, I have so many free things. My downloadable workbook called Relationship Magic at myrelationshipmagic.com, which helps people figure out their top four relationship values. It's very important when you're going out and dating again that you understand what it is that you want in a relationship and that you're very clear about it. And one of the things I always tell guys is if you understand what your partner's relationship values are, it's a shortcut to their happiness. It's like a cheat sheet to their happiness. If you treat, it's the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. The golden rule, we all know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Treat your partner the way you want to be treated. The problem is that when you really get down into the weeds of what makes a relationship work, when you treat your partner the way you want to be treated, you're, you're operating on your own relationship values, which are different than your partner's. So I'm going to give you some very specific examples of how to go at a higher level and have the, play the platinum rule. And the platinum rule is treat your partner the way they want to be treated and have them treat you the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Robert and Lauren are a couple that ran into a lot of trouble in their marriage because Robert was treating Lauren the way he wanted to be treated. He was, what she felt was he was always grabbing her and always trying to get sex from her. And what he was doing was trying to get the touch and affection that he wanted because his top relationship value was passion. His second relationship value was honesty. His third was fun and adventure. And his fourth 
was growth. He wanted a woman who loved to be cuddly and snuggly and get naked with him and touched him and kissed him a lot. He was very kinesthetic and he loved physical touch and affection. And he wanted someone who told him the truth, always told him the truth, was just like, I can handle anything but not knowing. I like to know everything. So just tell me everything. I love for you to do exciting things with me. I want to have a fun and exciting life. And I love it when you challenge me as a man and you show me my potential, you know, behind every good man is a good woman. Um, I want you to show me what I could do in life. And, you know, you, I want you to exalt me and hold me up and show me my potential. So that's what he wanted out of her, where Lauren wanted very different things. Uh, what she wanted number one was security. She'd had an, a, a childhood that wasn't completely secure. And as a woman, we often come into the world feeling a little bit unsafe compared to how men don't even think about their safety because they feel safe, you know, uh, generally. Uh, but women, we feel unsafe. She wanted to live in a secure home. She wanted to make sure that they had money in the bank, that the bills were paid. She didn't want to be in a relationship if she wasn't taken care of. And she was willing to earn money and, and dedicate her cash flow to the marriage as well. But she wanted him to have his eye on her and make sure she was safe because she started out feeling unsafe in her life. The second thing she wanted was kind of at odds with that. It was freedom. She was a, an extrovert and Robert was an introvert and she got all kinds of opportunities and party invitations. And, you know, people were always calling her up to come do something, you know, and she wanted to be able to do that. So she wanted Robert to totally take care of her, make sure she was safe, but also give her plenty of freedom to do things that he may or may not want to do. And then for her, she also valued honesty. She'd been in relationships where it was walking on eggshells and she didn't want that. She wanted to be able to have Robert be able to handle anything that she could say to him and know that he could stand firm in truth. And her fourth one, what was her fourth one? I'm trying to remember what it was now. Uh, it doesn't even matter because you kind of get the feeling mm -hmm. for what they're, what they're like and how they want different things. And so for her, she she never really had a touchy feely relationship. And so when he was grabbing her, it felt to her like he was always just like kind of going after her. When she realized what he was trying to do was get affection, she started sitting on his lap and wearing lingerie for him and getting in the shower with him when he was showering and sudsing him up a little bit and doing the kinds of things that made him the most happy because that's what she had to do. All the rest of the stuff she naturally did, but that was a place where she just kind of had to step it up a little bit. It wasn't the way she was used to doing things. And once Robert understood that she really needed to be taken care of and he got her door and he would always point out that everything was good for her and then just give her free reign to live her life, she felt like she was in the perfect relationship with him. And before that, he'd been a little controlling, a little insecure, a little grabby. And when all was said and done and they figured out their relationship values and explained them to each other, then when you get up every day and you're focused on what your partner wants from you, and they're focused on what you want from them, it feels like you are in a magic relationship. So when you're getting back out into the world, it's really good to know what it is you actually want, what your deal breakers are. And a lot of times people say, well, I'm not really sure what I want. And I say, well, you can figure it out by what you, you can start with what you don't want and then work from there. So the things you did not like about your last relationship are maybe the opposite of the thing that you really mm. wanted the most. Um, so the workbook facilitates this idea that you can go through the process. I've got, a, it's literally like a fill in the blanks kind of mad libs approach to figuring out what your top relationship values are. And then you rank order them and then you give them some specifics. So when you're talking to a partner, you can say, you know, I really, really love it when 
you take care of me. I really loved the way you moved that chaise lounge out into the sun and then brought the umbrella and made sure I wasn't going to get sunburned. It made it, it, it really met my security needs for being taken care of. Thank you so much for doing that. So they're little things and they manifest in myriad ways, but those top relationship values are like the 80-20. Knowing the top four gets you 80% of the way to a perfect relationship. You don't even know what the fifth one is. I just wonder how many marriages could be, could have been saved Almost by doing this work. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you are describing the disconnect between every divorce that I've ever done is yep. exactly like, this is the root of it. It is. That's crazy. It's super powerful. It's incredibly yeah. powerful. Yeah. It's tr that little book. I've sold 169,000, close to 170,000 copies of it. And it has saved marriages and created marriages and, and created incredible relationships for people. It's a, I, I have such a rewarding career. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if anyone's listening, this is a great resource if you are married and yeah. it's also a great resource if you're divorced and you're going yes. into the dating world, yes. because it, it is priming you to really get so clear on what you want. And I think that that's why the statistics are so high for second failed marriages and third and so forth is because people go into that next relationship, not clear on who they are and what they want and what they need from a relationship. So yeah. I love that. All right. So let's switch it up. Let's talk about dating post-divorce. Yeah. yeah. I, I, what does the world look like out there? Is this fun and exciting or, or is it terrifying? It's both in equal measure. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and it's not even as much terrifying as it is uh, confounding and annoying, right? I mean, when you're in dating hell, it is painful. But what I like to do is put a meta frame on things. So let me make a couple of, you know, proclamations, if you will. <laughs> the first one is that Online dating is absolutely fantastic. It is, it is a tool that you need. It's like trying to make a meal without pots and pans if you don't use it. Um, waiting for, when you are not online and you're just looking out in the world, you're not finding the breadth of potential partners that you could have access to. And what you want, and this is my number one takeaway I want you to have from this interview is that you have to think about dating as deal flow. So if you're a venture capitalist or an investment banker or a business development person or a salesperson, and you're trying to hit your number, if you don't have a lot of deals in the pipeline, you might miss your number. If you're trying to find the next love of your life, or at least the next, you know, hot boyfriend for a nice long week of lovemaking, whatever level you're at and whatever you're trying to accomplish. Um, if you don't have a lot of deal flow, then you're going to make early decisions that are not going to serve you well. The more people that are in your pipeline, the better decision you can make because you have more choices. It's like anything. We like multiple choices instead of just one option. Mm -hmm. So when you have deal flow, what you're really doing is you're just, you're cycling through a lot of prospects and you don't have to go out on dates with them all. So what you're doing is you're qualifying prospects. So when you go on online dating, and I recommend either Bumble or Tinder, I think that match.com is good if you're a little older and you just want to get married right away. But after you've been through a relationship or a marriage or two that hasn't gone well, what I recommend is to slow down, take your time and have a lot of dating experiences. They can be virtual at first and then move to IRL in real life. But let me tell you how the funnel flows, if you will. What you want to do is you, and I, and I personally like Tinder. I think it, there's just, it has the highest volume of people. And what we're talking about here is a numbers game. Mm -hmm. So you want, if you want deal flow, Tinder's the place to do it. And you can be on multiple applications. So maybe Bumble is the second one because then they say, you know, women are more in control. Well, the thing is women are always in control. We <laughs> do the picking. We own the pearly gates to heaven. And so <laughs> we do the picking. 
And uh, so you're in control. So once you know your relationship values and you know what kind of relationship you want to have, you look for someone that is a match for your values, someone who makes you feel the feelings you want mm -hmm. to feel in relationship. And you may have to explain those things and what they need to focus on. And then if they're not willing to do it, they're not your partner. And if they do it and they do it well, they could be a prospect for you. I think dating around is very, very important, but sleeping around is very, very dangerous. So there's two tiers to the process here. And what you want to think about with a funnel is you want to be in conversation with a lot of men. Let's just assume we're a woman and we're in mm -hmm. and we want a guy. You want to be in conversation on the dating app with a lot of men. You want the whole messages folder to be filled with conversations. And a lot of guys are going to try to rush you and get you off the app and get your, you know, start texting with you or pushing you to make a phone call. I don't like to text. I don't want to be texting all the time. Oh, you know, we should just have a phone call. And, and, and you say, well, you know, I'm happy to have a call with you when I'm ready to speak to you, but I'd like to get to know you a little bit over chat first, because I don't want to waste your time either. So you don't need to be pushed into anything. You're in charge. And when you start chatting with people, some of them aren't going to have anything to say, and they're going to peter out, or they're going to just be boring, or they're not going to put in any effort. So they were really not interested in you. But what you want to be doing is just swiping and liking as many guys as you think might be a possible person that you could maybe be interested in because they cannot communicate, their profiles are written poorly, their pictures look like crap. And so you're trying to find a heart of gold in a pile of stones. And that's not their fault. Men generally they don't know how to write profiles. They don't know how to pose for pictures. They have crappy pictures. And so really what you're doing is you're just saying, okay, well, maybe, maybe he's kind of cute or, oh, I like that thing he wrote in his profile. I was just at my girlfriend's house. I had my very first socially distanced, small group, outdoor party. Hallelujah. <laughs> I had some wine with some friends and it was really fun. And my friend Zahava, she, she met Jeff online. And I said, so what was it about Sahaba's profile that, that caught your attention? And he said, well, she had references to some really esoteric country and Western music on there. And I'm like, oh my God, if she knows whatever the name of the band was that I'd never heard of, if she knows blah, blah, blah band, she must be amazing. You know, you never know what it is that's going to be that little thing on a profile that intrigues you. And so my advice is to be very curious and intrigued by people knowing that their profile is shit, their pictures are awful, they don't know what to do, and they're terrible at chatting. That's all cool, because that's not what we really need from them. Anyway, this is just how we get to meet them. The thing that you want to do is begin to chat with them. And then you want to pretty quickly, if you're interested, move to the qualification round. And the qualification round is a series of questions where you say to them, listen, I just want to make sure that we are a values match. And I have some questions that are important to me to make sure that you and I might be possibly compatible. Would you mind answering some questions for me? And I would be happy to answer any questions for you as well. But let's kind of, let's kind of start there. Well, if they don't want to do that, you and remember, you can block anybody. So you don't have to deal with anybody's bull crap. So then you ask them questions. Now, your questions are going to be different than these questions, but I'm just going to give you some questions that you might ask that might be something where you're like, oh, yeah, I'd actually like to know that. And you know what else I'd like to know? So um, questions you might ask would be things like, um, how, what is your real age? <laughs> <laughs> Because the dating apps, sometimes they, they don't let you change it or it gets messed up and it never changed. Like you don't have a lot of control over some of the stuff in your profile. So what is your age? And then if it's important to you, things like, what is your height? Now for some women, especially taller women, they, you know, you're not, you don't want to date someone five, nine, if you're five eleven or whatever. So, you know, if there's like a physical body characteristic, that's important to you, you know, ask that. And then something like, are you employed? Mm. Are you, are you, ha do you enjoy your job is a, a, a nice way to say it. Are you, are you happily employed? Do you like what you do for a living? And then do you own your own car unless you're in an urban area? Like you'd be surprised 
when a guy shows up on his friggin' skateboard to Starbucks for your date with you, <laughs> you're going to wish you listened to Susan Bratton's advice, right? <laughs> a skateboard and you don't have a car how the hell did I (laughs) screw this one up right like how fast can I get out of here I guess I gotta buy his coffee for him too you know (laughs) so you know do you have a car do you own your own home who do you live with Mm. do you have a girlfriend a partner or a friend with benefit currently that's crazy that that has to be asked but I know that it does (laughs) I have heard so many stories. They do. Everybody has somebody on the side they're having sex with. So you want to know like how, you know, oh, well, she's in LA and we only have sex like once a month or no, she's my neighbor. And she comes over like every three nights and has sex with me, you know, like what, what is your current, you know, relationship status? Do you have children? Because they might, and you need to know that. Mm -hmm. And then where did you go to college? Did you graduate from college? is another important thing. And then for some people, it might be things like, do you have a COVID? Are you COVID vaccinated? Mm -hmm. Do you wear a mask? Mm -hmm. Um, Who did you vote for in the last presidential election? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a never Trumper, you don't want to go out with a Trump person, right? Mm -hmm. And, And if politics is important to you, and it could be something else that's important to you, but whatever that is, this is your list of questions. And you just type those out. You could have a cut and paste on your computer and be like, answer these questions. And then deci- decide whether they yeah. f- fit through the filter. And then say, you know what? I really appreciate it, but I don't think we're a match. And I really appreciate you answering those things. Thank you so much. And I wish I wish you well, but I'm a, I'm a never Trumper and I just can't do it. Or I'm six feet tall and I can't go out with a five nine. Or I've really found that dating people who don't, even though, you know, Bill Gates didn't graduate from college and whatever, I still have found that I need a college grad for someone that I could be, you know, have a serious wish. So let's say they, fi- they filter through the filter and, and, and you like them. Then the next thing that you want to do is you want to have, I, you want to chat with them a little bit more, and then you want to have a phone call or a video call. And I like a video chat. Yeah. The apps have video chat right on them now. You don't have to give them your messenger profile or, you know, your WhatsApp number or any of that stuff. You can have a video chat right on your phone. And that's what I would do. And when you do the video chat, I would recommend that you don't try and do any qualification, that you just connect with them, that you're just present you're kind, you're compassionate, you're not coming from a sense of lack or insecurity or that you need to be or do anything but present to who they are. And you just have a nice conversation with a stranger. How are, how are you doing today? How are things going for you? What'd you have for dinner last night? What are you doing this week? You know, what's on your mind? Whatever. I mean, you, you could end up with someone who's like, well, you know, my mom's sick in the hospital and my stepfather committed suicide and I'm feeling really badly. And you're like, okay, well, there's a person who's a freaking idiot because they started out a, com- a meet and greet on a dating site with all their problems. Like, this is not someone that you want to deal with. So you essentially want to give them a lot of open-ended opportunity to hang themselves, <laughs> right? You, you, that's yeah. what you want to do. You don't want to guide and lead the conversation. You want them to guide and lead the conversation because you're the one collecting the information. Mm-hmm. Let them ask the questions. Let them do the heavy lifting. Yeah. See how they do and whether you've got a connection. If you have a connection, then you might have another video chat. You might want to move to, you know, hey, let's use Messenger or something like that, or stay on the app. It doesn't matter. And then if they're like, well, I'm really impatient. Why don't we just get together? Say, well, what's your hurry? You know, I have to be very careful with who I meet with. Number one, my time is precious. And number two, there's just a lot of crazy guys out there. So you pressuring me isn't making me feel confident. It's making me feel a little uncomfortable. So if you want to have another call with me on video chat, I'd be happy to do it. 
there's no, no harm in having another conversation. What, are you so busy you can't have another conversation? And so that's another telling sign is, are they willing to work for the connection? Are they willing to meet you where you are? Or do they just have some pre-scripted notion of getting you off the platform so they can do whatever it is they're gonna do to you? Um, and so I think that's another piece of it. And if you are in conversation where you're like, God, I got a meet and greet, I got a video chat meet and greet, five days out of seven this week, this is good. You're on the right track then. You're just out there talking. And this is the thing that I wanna leave you with about that as well. And, and we can talk about lots of other stuff, whatever, you, wherever you wanna go, Renee, but I want you to think about it like, when you, I think about reading books, I read books constantly. I mean, every one of my friends writes books. I'm constantly buying books and reading books and they're not all great, but I'm, I get 10% out of every book I read, I get something out of every person I talk to and have a video chat with or just chat with. It's just about our humanity, our connection, our compassion, our, our joy of, of, of our humanity. So if you're not just like, well, I talked to a bunch of jerks this week, that is a bad way to approach this. A yeah. good way to approach this is, I had five great meet and greet video chats with nice guys who weren't right for me, but I enjoyed my time with them. And when you yeah. think about it that way, then you're having a good time. You're yeah. learning some new stuff. You're finding out about guys. You're just talking to people. And one of them is going to be a flashpoint. You have a date with them. But then you want the flashpoints and you want to go in person. You want to sit outside. You, want, you don't even want to commit to coffee. It's like park bench. Mm -hmm. A park bench date is the way to go. You, then there's no length of time where you have to say, okay, I've got to go. You can stay there for a while or not. Just bring a bottle of water with you or whatever. Bring your own coffee or whatever. And just say, hey, let's just meet on the park bench at blah, 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 and just say hi. You can sit six feet apart. You could wear masks or not, wherever you are and all of those kinds of things. And then you get to assess them, hear them, you know, get a feel for their vibe. And then you can go on to have a coffee date from there. There's no rush. There's no rush. Remember that the male species, the male of our species is extremely goal oriented. They are trying to hit the bullseye and yeah. the bullseye is our yoni with their penis. And they're yeah. driven to do that. They wanna accelerate and rush us to the end zone. But that's not us. We want to be sure we're safe, we like them, we're interested, they make us feel good, they're good men, you know, they're someone we want to be with, etc. And so it's on your schedule, but I want you to find joy in the process because it's the journey, not the destination. I love, I love your take on how un unapologetic you are with those questions. Like you are without any sort of hesitation and you're taking control of that. And I think that was the takeaway that I got from that is to really be comfortable with taking control of it. So Susan, let's yeah. talk about, we had, let's assume that this person had a fabulous date. They've had multiple meets and greets. Yeah. They've had actual couple dinner dates and now, now there's sex on the horizon. So yeah. how does the conversation start and how does someone set expectations and boundaries and all of that to take it to that next? level? Well, the first thing is, I would say <sighs> sex is going to come up on date one. So you really have to know where you sit with having sex. And the problem is that every time you have sex with someone, you can get bacterias and mites and chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV, HIV. Well, herpes. that just took the fun out of it. <laughs> right. Because it's literally could be a, a life or death situation. Yeah. They could give you COVID. They could give you another virus that no doc, no dermatologist could even tell you what it is. Like, a, well, I don't know what it is. Just rub some cream on it. Like, I don't want to get that <laughs> shit. Right. Nobody wants to get that stuff. So you have to be very, very safe sex oriented. And my recommendation, I think it's great to sleep around. I think it's great to have a lot of sexual partners in your lifetime, but they, you must 
use safe sex practices. And people think that condoms are safe sex. Like they'll say, okay, well, I'll ask people like, what's your safe sex practice? And they'll say, well, I, I use a condom. And I say, okay, well, do they go down on you? And they'll be like, yeah, they do go down on me, but I always use a condom for intercourse. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's not doing anything. Every Half the stuff can jump the condom and the other stuff is orally trans admitted. And most of STIs are skin to skin contact. Anyway, they're not even penis and vagina sex. So the condom is really good, maybe for HIV, maybe for HPV. And you know, there's no tests for HPV for men, which is a bummer too. So our pap smears are the HPV for women, but there's no such thing for men. So you, 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 the more people you have sex with, the more viruses, bacterias, DNA, et cetera, you're picking up from other people. So you, you really have to be very careful to pick your sex partners. So you want to make sure that you really like them. You're really hot for them. There's tons of chemistry and there's a two level process. The first is that before you have intercourse, you should, or oral, you should demand that they get a series of STD tests. And the other thing is that you want to know who else they're sleeping with and how long ago they've slept with them. Mm. So you can get rapid STD tests that are if they've been abstinent for a month, but you can get cheaper tests if they've been abstinent for 90 days. So you need to know when their last unprotected sexual contact was. And honestly, unprotected doesn't really matter because the condom doesn't barely protects anything. So you want to find out who they're having sex with, how often, how many people you want to do a sexual history conversation with them. And then you want them to go take tests and you can take tests too. If you don't have a current ones, if, they, if, you, if you have old tests and you haven't had sex with anybody, you can use those tests. But if you haven't and you've had sex with someone, you need to go get new tests. You guys go get your tests, you share your test, you read the test, you look at the test, you decide and figure out what they have. Okay, oral herpes. All right, that's no big deal. Yeah, do, can you tell when you get a fever blister? Or can you tell when you get a genital herpes breakout? How, can you abstain from sex when you have that? Do you know that genital herpes comes out on your back and not just your penis? Have you ever had any breakouts on your lower back that feel like itchy or hurdy? You know, these are questions that you might want to ask. And once you have the STI test and you're safe, then you can decide, okay, what's your contraceptive level as well? Do Are you using like Daisy Fertility Awareness Method or an intrauterine device, which are my two recommendations? I don't like the pill. I think it screws up your hormones and it's not a good thing. Uh, and so these are the things that you need to be thinking about. And then you can always use a condom in addition to everything else you're doing too, right? That is another mm -hmm. level of safety. So a double safety type of thing, like a non-medicated IUD or a fertility awareness method with a condom is pretty good once you've had STI tests with a partner. So what you're not doing is you're not going out and dating and screwing a bunch of guys. What you're doing is you're going out with a bunch of guys and figuring out who you want to screw. <laughs> <laughs> And then hopefully you've had enough dates with them that you have a really hot romance and you've got really great mm. sex and you enjoy that. And you can still be dating other people without having sex with them. So you can date as many men as you want. You can be ethically non-monogamous, safe sex oriented, which is a very nice way to do things. Um, on my website, betterlover.com, I have how to have the safe sex talk, when to have the safe mm. sex talk, what STIs to get, how to ask sexual history questions. I mean, you can text these things. You don't even have to speak them. A lot of people, yeah. but what I tell women is, what I tell everyone is, people across the gender spectrum is, the more you have the discussions, the easier they get. And you're a grown ass woman and you need to take care of yourself because men are much more cavalier about STIs than women. The onus falls on us for contraception and STI safety absolutely does. Our vaginal mucosa is much more fragile and friable. It's able to take in many more bacterias and infections and viruses and things. And you don't want to have, you don't want to catch something that you're going to have for the rest of your life and struggle with. I think or we even just, have to take broad spectrum antibiotics, which ruin your microbiome, right? I think we just scared every post divorce <laughs> woman from having sex ever. <laughs> no, not at all. What I told you to do is how to have it safely. Yeah. What I told you yeah. to do is how to have sex and protect yourself. I want you to have 
completely surrendered, incredible chemistry, super mm. hot sex. I want you to explode the quality and quantity of hot sex that you are having with a new lover. I mean, that's the end game here is you want to be swept off your feet with desire and romance with some amazing person. And so you've got to lay in the foundation for that. And they're going to rush you because their target is mm. you. And they have to wait until you are ready. That is their job is to support and foster your comfort and desire. Ah, that's, that's amazing. Susan, you are amazing. You are a wealth of knowledge. Like I'm just, I'm just sitting here and taking it all in. You have so many resources out there. You have so many books, so many um, free resources, and you have the relationship magic, which is a downloadable. Where should we send people to get all of that? Okay. Well, the STI information is all at betterlover.com. And my relationship magic is where the, you can, you can get relationship magic on Amazon, but it's more expensive, the physical version. I just say, go to myrelationshipmagic.com and download it at the discount link so that you can print out the workbook. It's yeah. just as easy to print out the sheets at home and do them yourself that way. You don't need to have a hard copy book. And um, those are two of the best places. You can follow me on Instagram at Susan Bratton. And my main website is personallifemedia.com. And there's a search box on that website that will search on any sexual and relationship subject you can think of. I've written thousands of articles. And typically what pops up is an ebook that's a free technique of some kind that that you can download as well. So I, and I also have an, a sex tips and intimacy tips email newsletter at personallifemedia.com. And I send out sex tips and intimacy tips five days a week. Oh my gosh, so much. Thank you so much, Susan. I am so grateful that you took the time to chat with us and share all of your knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Renee.